I got a couple questions this week, good questions, I thought. So I want to take just a minute uh, before we read the text and get into today's uh, sermon, which is actually five slides, five really sermons, uh, but we don't have the time, so we're going to do a lot of slides today to get you good 30,000 foot view of what's happening here in the rest of the text. But one of the questions I got is, how do we know, Brent, when we come to, soul, uh, when we come to something in Scripture that is cultural? Because... What do we hear from uh, the liberal uh, uh, forms of, of Christianity today? We hear this book is old, it's all cultural, none of it sticks, none of it matters today. That's called heresy, my friend, and not true. 99.9% .9 of the Bible is straightforward and can be taken literally. And doctrine is for all people at all times in all places. The gospel is for all people at all times in all places, what the Bible calls sin is sin for all people at all times in all places. Amen. Amen. But we do come to these, these weird places. Like last week, we got into this head covering at the end of 1 Corinthians. It's going to be talking about a holy kiss. There is a great little resource. Let me just show you. It's called Manners and Customs of the Bible. J.I. Packer was a part of this one. It's really good. But ultimately, the church has always known when you get to a place in the text where it just things that make you go, hmm. Uh -uh. No, nobody? I thought most of you were my age. Um, right, when we get to the end of this book and it says greet one another with a holy kiss, if you start scratching your head going, what does that mean? You're probably dealing with something that is cold. You're going to have to dig back into the manners and customs of that ancient world to be able to understand what the holy kiss was and how it applies to our lives some 2,000 years later. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, my sweet little Sunday school teacher, we were talking about tattoos. And she, she just shook her head. She said, oh, no. And she went back to Leviticus. And she was like, no, the Bible says do not mark your body in any way. So I grew up thinking that getting a tattoo was a sin. But it was only later as I began to study the Bible that I realized that Canaanite cultures all around God's people would, would brand people, would mark the bodies of their saves, slaves the same way that uh, today a rancher would brand and mark cattle. Uh, so, so obviously that sweet little girl who wants to get a Bible verse on her elbow or or wherever. That, that's not the same application. God didn't want his people to identify as slaves or owned by someone else because he is their only master. He's the one who owns the cattle on a thousand. He's the one who uh, has purchased his people. So there are those places, right? Uh, First Peter talks about women not braiding their hair, right? When you're reading the Bible, you should read that and, and scratch your head and go, What's wrong with braiding your hair? Well, when you go back into the manners and customs of the first century, you realize that in this particular place, the prostitutes wore braided hair. It's how they advertised that they were open for business. So obviously, if someone has braided hair here this morning, you're not, you're a Christian and you're not open for business, amen? If you're unmarried, you're chaste and holy. Uh, if you're married, you are faithful uh, to your husband. The big idea from chapter 11 is, and man, does our world need this. Men and women are created equal, but they're different. They're given different roles within the realm of creation. Paul grounds the argument in creation and big idea. Men should not look like Dylan Mulvaney. Men should look like men. It should not be embarrassing to a man to see a Dylan Mulvaney on TV. Men should look like men, talk like men, act like men, uh, and be initiated and in acting in the responsibilities men are given to protect and to provide, to cover our, our wives if we are lucky enough to, to be married. And in the same vein, women should look like women. Act like women and talk like women. Can a woman do that in today's age with shorter hair? Of course, femininity and masculinity, right? The world wants to destroy it. The world wants to erase it. But God made men to be masculine. By the way, Samson had long hair. God made women to be feminine and we should honor him uh, as we present ourselves to this culture we live in in 2023, amen? So second thing I want to say just real quick, 
Because I had this incredible exchange with this dear sister, sweet as can be. She said, Brent, it's been a conviction of mine since I was a young Christian. I just, I, I hear everything you say. I understand what you're saying, but I just, I want to do it the way that, that Paul wanted them to do it then. I don't care if it's 2000. I, I want to wear that. Can I do that? Is there a place for me at four points? The answer is yes. Of course there's a place, especially when, I mean, talking to her was like talking to a unicorn. She, that, not in a bad way. She was, she was innocent. She had no motive. She had no chip on her shoulder. There was no pride or self-righteousness. She loves our church. Can I still be a part uh, even though I disagree? Of course you can. We love you and and we're glad you're here. Uh, As long as no one gets self-righteous or proud or this is the only way to do it and I'm more holy than you and, and I've figured it out and got it right and all you are wrong. As long as that's not going on, we are good. Amen? Because what does God want? Even though we're all a little different, we've all got a a little different spin about us. God wants unity in the church, which is what we're talking about today. So let's move. Verse 17. Here's what we're going to do for sake of time. I'm going to read it all. And then we're going to 30,000 foot view, start unpacking uh, the text. So listen closely. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you Come together. It is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal, One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly... We would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together, eat and wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you we're not deaf, blind, and dumb, but you prepared a way for us. Father, everything we need to know, you tell us. You give us the answers that we need to walk after you in this world. Lord Jesus, help us. Bring us together this morning. Unify us in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus' name everybody says amen. Amen. Now, real quick, let's look at the context of verse 17 through verse 34, because I don't want you, we're we're fixing to move through a lot of information, and it's all helpful. It's all important. You need to know it all. So take pictures uh, of slides as they come up. But I don't want to lose the context of what's happening here. Remember, in uh, the beginning of chapter 11, Paul says, he starts with the, the positive. You're doing good. 
Men are looking like men, acting like men. Women are looking like women, acting like women. That's good. I commend you in that. But here's something I do not, I cannot commend you in. He even says, it would be better if you didn't even meet at all if this is the way you're going to conduct yourselves. Now that is a serious statement made by the Apostle Paul. It'd be better if you guys just didn't come together at all if this is the way you're going to act. So what is the problem? The problem is there are divisions in the church. And listen, I'm going to try to, and some of you are going to hate this, but I'm going to try to, t- to temper down because I kind of went on some wild, wild goose chases <laughs> last service. Uh, but the reality, because there's so many divisions in the church and it hurts my feelings. And we, even at four points, things are so good, but, but we've had little schisms and little factions and people leave and it's always so stupid. It's always over nothing and it's always so hurtful as people draw battle lines, pick out their swords and there can be no relationship because I want to go this way and you guys are going this way. It's just always so, there's so many divisions and we shouldn't be a divided people. The whole context of the body and blood of the Lord is for to unite God's people. God is not happy that there are 350 charismatic denominations alone in our country. God is not happy when we constantly are drawing swords and trying to chop off the heads of our brothers or sisters over some theological niche verse somewhere. Oh, the Bible says don't put a ring. You know the Bible says don't put a ring in your nose? It says that. But then in other places, they're actually God, God himself puts a ring uh, in, a, in, in, in a person's nose. Right? If you, culture, manners, and customs. In the places where God says don't, it's because slaves had the, like the rings in the bull nose. Right? We, we go to these weird, obscure places and we try to make new theological teams. And the church divides. When Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer, what did he want more than anything? Lord, may they be one. Speaking of his disciples, us, God's people, may they be one as you and I are one. This is a divided church. And Paul says, because you're divided, it's better that you just don't meet at all unless you can repent, change, and do it the right way. What were they? What's the division here in chapter 11? Chapter 3, the division was over leaders in the church. Chapter 11, it's over the haves and the have nots. There are, now, get this, understand this. For all you people that really wanted to be the New Testament church, you wouldn't be here today. You'd be meeting in a home because that's where they met. And communion would, would be served during what was called a love feast. Jude verse 12 calls it the love feast. They would eat an entire meal because eating a meal with one another, breaking bread with, with one another was in the ancient world in the first century. It, it was the most communal thing people could do. It was a way of opening yourself up to others. So when this was like a potluck, everybody would bring to uh, the church uh, this potluck meal. And some people were able to bring more and some people weren't able to bring anything. And so the people who had a lot would bring a lot and they would just start eating and, sh- and shoving their faces full because that's what they're used to doing. They have. While the people right next, they wouldn't even notice the people right next to them who had nothing, who were starving, who were looking at them like, my dogs look at me when I sit at the table. They just come and they, they sit and they... Because they know I'm eating. And sometimes I'm dumb enough to actually give them something from the table, which only enforces the terrible behavior. But they just look so sad. The the haves didn't notice the have-nots were salivating at the mouth as they gorged themselves like the steward of Gondor when he's making Pippin sing to him. And he's blah, 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 blah. The juice is running down his beard. And Pippin's like, you nasty pig. And you're doing everything wrong. This is the con, this is the, div- the division that has happened. People aren't caring and serving one another in the church when they come to the table of the Lord, which is the great equalizer of all people. Doesn't matter who you are at the table of the Lord. If you have, if you have not, if you're all white, black, red, brown, yellow, if you are bald or have hair, at the table of the Lord, we are all equally in need. Listen, my knees are going to fall before the Lord 
The same as Donald Trump's knees are going to fall before the Lord. Same as Joe Biden's knees are going to fall before the Lord. Same as Joe the plumber's knees is going to fall before the Lord. Same as your knees. When we come to the table of the Lord, all our knees are bent because God saves and we are the ones who need to be saved. Amen? Amen. So, man, the body and the blood should be the most unified place among the people of God. The problem is it's not in Corinth. So Paul goes into the doctrine, the teaching part. He begins the doctrine with, I'm not making this up. This is what God gave me. Look at verse 23. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. He goes back to the last supper of Christ himself. And he said, this is the liturgy. This is how Jesus instituted this meal. That's uh, verses 23 through 26. And then he gives application. So examine your, this is a big deal. Examine yourself. We're going to talk about the warning that comes and how some are sick and some have actually died because they weren't doing it right. And the solution, which if I ever wrote a book, which I probably never will because only really arrogant people write books who think they know everything and I don't know anything. So, but if I ever wrote a book, it would be this, just be cool. This is Paul's thing here. Just be cool. Shit, man, look around. This is not just about you. This is about all of us, the body of Christ. This is about him saving us all because we all need saving. Be cool. If you have more and somebody's hungry, share. Notice. Open your eyes. Look around. Here's our 30,000 foot view of this text. Now, let me just point out a couple things real quick. Look at verse 17. At the end, it says, and underline this in your Bibles, because five times we're going to see this phrase here. Come together. When you come together. Look at verse 18. You see it again. When you come together. Look at verse 20. When you come together. Look at verse 33. So my brothers, when you come together. Verse 34. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home. So that when you come together. Our, all you guys at the lake, the church is supposed to. It's why Hebrews says, do not forsake the fellowship. Do not forsake the coming together. I actually wanted to call the sermon series for 1 Corinthians, Come Together. But I got voted out and we went with a beautiful mess. But wouldn't it be cool if every Sunday you come in, the lights come on and you hear, boom, 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 doo, 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 doom, doom. That would have been good. Would have been better than a beautiful mess, I think. (laughs) We are supposed to do this. Whether it's the context of a home, like in the ancient world, or, or now because society is what it is, and we live in the greatest country on planet Earth, we can have a building where more of us can gather together than just a, a, a few that's why the large churches in the, in the New Testament had to meet in the, the wealthiest patrons' homes because they had the courtyards, they had the, the bigger spaces. Jerusalem had to meet uh, in the temple courts because it was the largest church we know of in the New Testament. It had over 8,000 people we know of, but most ancient counts are just the, the husbands. So that, probably three times bigger than that if you add a kid and a wife in to most of that number. They had to find places. We have all of this. And we should come together because God wants a visible people on planet earth that reflect his glory. We do that individually. We saw that in chapter seven, but we also do that corporately. We saw that in chapter three of this very book that we're studying. Coming together is important. Don't forsake it. Don't say, well, I'm just going to meet my friend and we're going to talk about John 3, 16 at Buffalo's Wild Wings and that'll count. It doesn't count. We got to come together as God's people, unified. Also, look at this real quick before we start slides. Look at verse 25. At the end, he says, do this as often as you drink it. And then verse 26, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the blood. In this chapter, that symbolizes the unity Christians have when they come together around the body and blood, we divide. 
every church, every denomination, they have their liturgy and, and they're, they're separate from other churches because one guy says we should do it once a month. Another guy says, no, we should do it every time we're together. One guy says, well, you know, the, the Last Supper was really the Passover meal. The Jews only ate that once a year. So really we should only do communion once every year. There's all kinds of men with all kinds of ideas, but the Bible doesn't specifically say. So as often as we break out this cup, Let's unify over the body and blood and not get caught up in the theological niche details of guys who think they're smart but are really just divisive jerks. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, let's talk about, more about how we divide when God's purpose is to unify us. Look, look at the names of communion. Paul uses every one of these names. And again, it's, it's called other things in other places of the Bible too, like the love feast from Jude verse 12. But Paul uses every one of these. Back in 10, we saw the participation, the koinonia in the Greek there. It's also translated by several uh, English Bibles as communion. It's where we get the word communion. So if you're Baptist, you know your Baptist pastors went here and said, this is the way it's got to be done. All those other ways are wrong. 1 Corinthians 10, 21, it's called the Lord's table. Now, each one of these gives us a little semblance of, of some unique part of what we're about to do. They're all important, which is why we should honor all of them. The Lord's table is looking forward to that future table. This, all the spoils of war as God defeats all his enemies. He's already defeated them on the cross, but at his second coming, they will actually be defeated and judged and sent away. And then all the spoils of war are going to be out on the table. And you and I in Christ, we're invited to sit at that table. The choicest meats. You vegetarians are going to hate it. Right? The wine's going to flow like a river. Right? This is the Lord's table. The Lord, it's also called the Lord's Supper because it was the Passover meal where Jesus said, hey, what you've been commanded to do for thousands of years, what the Jewish people had practiced for thousands of years, Jesus says, I'm going to change it tonight. It's a new covenant that I'm enacting tonight. The old covenant was a shadow. That, that taught you that when you sin, something has to die. And that what has to die has to be perfect. Well, tonight I reveal to you, I'm the perfect lamb. I'm the one who's never sinned. I'm the one who's going to sacrifice myself for you. This is my body. This is my blood. That's the Lord's Supper. The Eucharist, high churches, they like this name because they like everything Greek and Latin and all that kind of stuff. They're high, 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 high and mighty. They don't wear hats, Kelly, in church. I saw you over there. Oh, they do it right. We do it wrong. Uh, the Eucharist, to give thanks. That's all it means. It's a Greek word for give thanks. We find it right here in this text in uh, verse 20, uh, 24. And when he gave thanks, Eucharisteo, the root Eucharist. Lowbrow churches call it breaking bread. House churches, people who think we're going to do it the Bible. Breaking bread is, is the term that they use because Jesus did break the bread. The point is, look at how we divide. It's called the Eucharist. No, it's called communion. No, or it's the Lord's table. All these terms can be used interchangeably and should be used interchangeably. Paul himself uses them interchangeably. We don't have to pull out our swords and fight on the hill over what we're going to call it when we come to unified the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Let's look now at the purpose which centers in verses 23 through 26. What is actually happening? Because the Bible tells us something's happening. Remember, we're not to participate in the pagan temples. If we participate in the Lord's body, something's happening. So if you're at a pagan temple, you don't even believe in the pagan God. Something's still happening there. That's why Paul says you can't sit at the Lord's table and the table of demons. What we're going to do today, something is happening. What's happening starts way back in chapter 10, which we've already talked about. We are looking up. We are participating in the perfect life 
That we did not live the sacrificial death that covers and atones for our sin. It is with joyful thanksgiving. So Eucharist is a great word. We are looking up giving thanks. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving me. We're looking up as we're looking back. Jesus says, when we're eating this bread, we're drinking this cup, we are remembering this event that happened in history. The gospel is not intuitive. You're never going to come up uh, upon it on your own while you're sitting under a tree. Nature can reflect God to us, but we're never going to get to the bloody cross of Christ without remembering that God became flesh. The God who created space and time. The God who sits outside of space and time. Because we were sinners that could not save ourselves. He broke into his own creation. God stepped into space and time and wrapped himself in human flesh. The incarnation of Christ. We're remembering that he, God, became like one of us and did what we could not do. And then he died in our place for our sins. We're we're looking up thankful as we remember the gospel itself, what Jesus Christ has done. But we're also looking outward. Look at verse 26. Let's read verse 26 real quick. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And this is important for the unbelievers that may have drug problems. They were drug here today. They don't want to be here. But when we do this, we are proclaiming that, yes, God did come. God did live perfect. God did die in our place. For We're proclaiming the gospel to those who don't know the gospel. So we're looking up. We're, uh, uh, we're, we're looking um, back. We're remembering. We're also proclaiming to those who may not know the Lord, his death, this happened. This is what it means. Also in verse 26, until he comes, we're looking forward to that table that is set for us, the the, the marriage supper of the lamb, the table that Christ invites us to. He did come and he is coming again. And we anxiously, hopefully, expectantly wait and long for his return when all things that are wrong will be made right. We look up, we look back, we look out, we look forward, we look within. Look at verses 27 through 32. This is the warning part. This is the serious part because we should not come to this in an unworthy manner. Who belongs? Some of you might be hearing this and say, man, I don't want to get sick. I don't want to die. I'm just not going to take it. Why would, I, why would I even participate if there's a chance I could get it wrong? Look at the Heidelberg Catechism real quick. Verse 81. When we look within ourselves, this is what we're doing. You, want, you know what it's like to get this wrong? It's the person who comes and takes the bread and eats, drinks the blood without thinking that he really, you know, I've been good this week. I don't even need this. That's the person who's taking it wrongly. That's the person who is unaware. It's the person who says, you know what? I've been victorious this week. I'm in need of nothing. The pride, the arrogant, those are the people when they're participating in the Lord's Supper, they're doing it wrong. Look at verse um, Oh, this is my favorite verse in this whole, uh, verse 31. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. There are those who, when they look in the mirror, they don't see who they really are. When they look in the mirror, they say, you know what? I should start a blog because I'm just so smart. I'm the expert. We think, I know some of you like Joel Osteen. People leave the church every time I mention his name. But you are not the champion. Judge yourself rightly. Look in the mirror and realize he's the champion. You're in need of the champion. The Heidelberg Catechism, who should come to the table of the Lord? Those who are displeased with themselves. The perfect? No, because there is no perfect save one. Christ. Don't be scared to come to the table if you had a bad week. 
This exactly what you need to be thinking about as you come to the Lord. Forgive me. I must thank you for grace. Thank you for your perfect body. Thank you for your atoning blood that covers my sin. Who should come to the table? Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. It's not just if you had a bad week. When we come to the body and blood, all the sin. Man, I still remember sins I committed when I was five and six years old. And I'm, you know, not bad. I didn't do anything bad. I just, but it was sin to sneak stuff out of the fridge. You go behind the chair and <laughs> shove it in there. When I knew it was wrong, it was against the rules of the house. I mean, I was a sinner who broke the lamp. Gina did. My sister, yeah, it wasn't me. She gets beat and I'm a <laughs> sinner, sinner. I got older. Of course, I was super rebellious. I really sinned big time. About anything you can think of, I, I did, except homosexuality. I never did that. <laughs> but everything else I did. <laughs> well, not BCL. I never did that either. <laughs> but everything else I did. <laughs> Some of you are like, I wonder if you did. I didn't do that probably, but it's just bad, just dumb, stupid, arrogant, ridiculous, not knowing what I didn't know. As a Christian man, constantly, it's Romans 7. I know what I should be doing, but it's not what I'm doing because sometimes I just don't want to. Sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I'm stressed. Sometimes I'm busy. And I don't call and I don't visit. I don't do the things I know I I should be doing. Right? All of our past sin when we come to the table. All of our present sin. Even the sins we're not aware of. The areas where pride, greed, all these uh, dishonesty, all these things that are in all of us. They're common to man. But not only that, all the sins I'm going to commit. Body and the blood covers past sins, present sins, future sins. Man, that looking up, that joyful thanksgiving as we come to the body and blood of the Lord, why would we not be? Because we don't come to the table as the victor. We come to the table because there is a greater victor, a victor who we need to conquer our sin. His name is Jesus. This is what it means to look within. This is what it means to examine yourself. If there's any point in your heart where you're like, man, I'm killing it. You need to examine. You need to ask the Holy Spirit, show me again why I need you. And let him expose your sin, your idols in your mirror so that you can rightly and repentantly share in the body and the blood of the Lord as the rightful, needful applicant. He doesn't need us. We need him. Uh, Go back to the the look up, the look out. There's there's one last thing in verses 33 and 34 that's happening as we partake in this today. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, now we've already looked outward because we're proclaiming the gospel as we come to the body and the blood. But we're also looking around. This is not something to open up and do yourself by yourself. We wait on one another. That's what he says. Wait for one another. This is something we do corporately as God's people together. Right? The tall the short, the fat, the skinny, all of us from our different backgrounds, our different ideas, our different preferences. Some of you are like, I love worship today. That was awesome. Some of you are like, why do they do it? Where's the Randy Rhodes guitar? All, our, all of the things that could divide us. What happens when we come to the, we look around and we wait on one another and we realize we're all in this together and we need one another and none of us are better than any of the other ones of us. 
And self-righteousness, man, it's in all of us. I haven't told this story in a long time, but one time I was in, I was going in, I was 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was late for an appointment. I was trying to get somewhere, and oh, the car doesn't have gas, so I'm trying to figure out the gas situation. I pull in, I run in, I've just got some cash I'm going to lay down on the counter. I'm 10 bucks over in public, and there's this one guy in front of me. And on the counter, this guy looks homeless. On the counter, he's got a carton of cigarettes and a 30-pack of natural light or some Bush League beer. And I'm sitting back there in a hurry. And this guy's like got a bag of nickels. He's trying to pay for this stuff. And it's my sin. It's your sin. Because you'd probably think the same thing I thought. This big freaking waste pile of flesh. Get out of my way. Some of us are important. Some of us got things to do. Don't get to sit around drinking natural light all day and smoke cigarettes. And it's when, and, and I say, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me, and that freaks some people out. But I always know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me because it's something that I would never ask myself. <laughs> My head was going this waste of life. Get out of my way. And when that question pops into your head that says, is that person any more important than you, or any less important than you do? Do I love that person less than I love you? That's when I go, oh, Holy Spirit, heart check, self-righteousness. Forgive me. Help me get that out of me. We look around. Nobody's better than the next. But he's an elder, but he's a deacon. She is a ministry leader. He serves over here. They get to pray all the time. Probably we're all together equal at the table of the Lord. You mean the guy that lives in the big house on the corner and me from the, the trailer park over here? We're the, yes, in Christ Jesus We've got to think about one another. We've got to wait about on one another because it pleases the Lord. If we're not going to do it this way, together, Paul says, don't even meet at all. This is what is happening. We're looking up. We're looking back. We're looking outward. We're looking forward. We're looking within. And we are looking around, waiting on one another, doing this simultaneously together. It seems pretty simple, right? I mean, oh, what in here other than, can you believe God would judge people for doing that wrong, make them sick and even die? Yes! God makes a lot of people die in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. You know why he does that? To show us how serious he is about his salvation in our sin. We need these examples. We need this teaching. So we will take this seriously. But it seems pretty simple when we come together. As often as we do this, we should do it. In this way, we should be thinking about these things. But along comes man. And this is what I call adventures in missing the point. Let me tell you something for everybody in here, because there has been a time in your life here at the church where you've wondered, why do they do it this way? Why do they do it that way? Why? I think it might be better this way. I think it might be better that way. Because this is what men do. This is what mankind does. I say that generally. Men and women, we all have our preference. We're all experts in our own eyes. We're all armchair quarterbacks. And we write books and we start blogs and we do all these things that bring division where there should be nothing but unity. And I've got historic examples for you today of how we have missed the point. Our, you know why our church works? Because we keep the main thing the main thing. You know when we're going to talk about head coverings? The one time every 15 years we're going through 1 Corinthians and we're in chapter 11. Because head coverings is not the main thing. It's not even close. It's a niche verse mentioned one time in all of Scripture. Do we need to know about it? Do we need to understand it? Yes, men should look like women. Women should look like men. Are we going to set up camp there? No, because that's foolishness. It brings division. Are we going to get all hostile over washing feet? Jesus said to do it. 
But when you understand the culture and when you invite someone to your home, you should have, if you're wealthy, you have a servant. If you're not wealthy, you have one of your kids at the front door with the bowl because for people to get to your home, they're walking in open toe sandals through dusty dirt streets. And when they reclined at the table, they actually reclined. They laid down their feet were right next to the food. So somebody would be there to wash the feet. When you understand the context, you understand what Jesus is saying. Oh, that you, oh, we're the national church of feet washing. We're going to wash everybody's feet every Sunday. That's not the point. The point is serve one another. The way that Christ is serving the disciples, he says, now you go out and serve like I've served you. I did the work of a servant. I did not count myself as greater or higher I lowered myself to the form of servant and you need to do the same. The greatest among you will be a servant. Four points, we major in the right thing. We keep the main thing, the main thing. And God continues to, as long as we lift up Jesus, he's blessing us and we're experiencing his, his presence and his blessings. Don't try to get us off course with the theological niche fads. Look at that nostalgic view down there. I put that one on there. I made that one up. But I've known a hundred guys just like this. They come in and, and it's... In the charismatic church, you get heresies. You get liberation theology. You get prosperity gospel. right? You get just downright heresy. In the reformed church, you get theologically niche fads by young guys who've never really done anything in ministry, but they've got all the answers and want to sit down and lecture you who've been doing it for 25 years on how to do it the right way. There's those guys, and they've got their verse. Do you remember the house church fad a couple years ago? America's doing it wrong. We all know all these buildings. It's all, it's all New Testament. They only met in houses, and here's the verse. They met in a house, and the wine was real wine, which the wine is real wine. Look at verse, uh, where am I? Look at verse uh, 21. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. Now, I don't know about you, and as a Baptist, you're going to get mad at me, but just bear with me. I don't know about you. I have drank a lot of grape juice in my life. It has never made me drunk. <laughs> That's an enormous amount of grape juice you're drinking to get drunk off of it. Right, This whole idea of the wine in the Bible is not real wine is ludicrous. It's nonsense. It does, it, there's, a, there's a word for grape juice that's never used. They use the word for wine. <laughs> Jesus' first miracle is not turning water into sin. That's good. It's real wine. But are there culturally th things they did back then that we're not going to do today? Of course. Why don't we serve real wine? Would it be a sin to serve real wine? No. It'd be fine. It'd be more expensive. <laughs> it's one reason we don't do it. Also, there are children and underage people in here. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into the, we could probably have, have some religious exemption where we could serve underage people uh, while under a communion, but I just I don't, don't want to do that. It seems like a lot of work just so we can say we're really biblical people. There's always this guy. It's got to be in the house. It's got to be real wine. We're house church, real wine. It's got to be a meal. Can't just be this, right? That's the way the early church did it. Just self-righteous, hyperact, bleh. The house church fetch came. Reformed churches were decimated as somebody that had some influence with six, eight families would cause them all to leave. They'd go start their house church. Of the two dozen house churches I personally know of, how many of, you, how many of them do you think are in existence today? None. They weren't in existence two years later because it was niche theological work. It was a fad within the Reformed community. It happens every two to three years. And listen, I say this as your pastor. Don't get caught up. I love you. I hate seeing someone taken advantage of by some online shyster who lies about his seminary credentials and wrote some book that you think is gospel now when it's not gospel. The gospel is the body and the blood. Only the body and the blood is going to save you. It's not the body and the blood plus holy kissing. It's not the body and the blood plus not marking yourself. It's the body and the blood and the body and the blood alone. Don't fall for the charlatanism. 
You know why people have online ministries? Because they can't have real ministries locally where people know them. You guys are slow today. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I know guys that live in this area, they'll fly across the country if 10 people will give them some time and treat them like they're the expert on something. It's just, it's snake oil salesmen. They always have been, they always will be. Reformed community is full of them. Uh, we had a guy one time who came to me. He's like, I want to write a book. He, this, this one little place in chapter 7 where it, the Bible says uh, a, a woman should give her conjugal rights and a man should give his conjugal rights. And woo, that's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. But then the next part says, unless they decide for a time to withstand for purposes of prayer and seeking the Lord. The guy wanted to write a book on fasting, sex, and marriage. And I was just like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> what do you think that's going to do for the kingdom of God? And you know what? I was right because today that guy no longer comes here and he's not even still married theological niche. Don't take the, the did you know 99.9% .9 of the Bible all Christians agree on. You can fit everything Christians disagree on. The Nephilim, all this stuff. You can fit it all on six pages of your Bible. Don't be the guy that majors in the six pages. Be the guy that majors in the gospel itself. If when you are talking, people aren't falling more in love with Jesus, stop talking because you're not doing any good for the body of Christ it all has to lead to Jesus none of this stuff matters the Bible doesn't specify any of this stuff it's just man being man trying to be smart oh, look at me look at me I got my pipe I'm smoking I'm so smart I'm C.S. Lewis enough of those guys in the reform community enough we are sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And as we proclaim, the church grows.